It is a final word, and as promised, we have the chief cricket correspondent of the age, Dan Bredig, who must be uh, the guest who's come on the show more than anyone else over the years. Good evening to you, Bredo. You've been a busy boy over the weekend. You've been writing stories about uh, internal ICC politics, BCCI politics, Jay Shah, and the future of him, the future of Test cricket. You've been all over it, so I thought this would be a timely moment to get you back on and give us a bit of an update. Hello. Greetings, Colo. Yeah, uh, July was a busy month last year for very different reasons. Um, but yeah, it started out busy again this time for future of cricket reasons, which I tend to sink my teeth into. Yeah, you do. Let's start with the, the Greg Barclay piece to this about him moving on from his position at the end of his term and how that intersects with uh, the probability that Jay Shah will need to leave his current post at the BCCI. What are the machinations there to give us a bit of a, a framework around our conversation? Yeah, so uh, Greg Barclay has done is in the back end of the second of his second two-year term. Now, under the ICC constitution, he can do three two-year terms. Um, and there was actually a tweak to the constitution earlier this year that whoever replaces him gets to do two three-year terms. So it means the same aggregate of time, uh, technically, but it also means more, uh, more time spent doing and less time spent electioneering, I suppose. Jay Shah's term as the secretary of the BCCI is up uh, next year in 2025. So he's been there since 2019. You can only do two, three-year terms at the BCCI because of the Supreme Court changes that happened when uh, the IPL spot-fixing scandal happened. So mm. uh, that means that he's either got to stay out of cricket for a bit or he's got to get another job sort of adjacent to the BCCI role so that he can still be the most kind of influential person in the room. And he needs to be the most influential person in the room for all sorts of cricket and non-cricket reasons uh, in terms of the, I suppose you'd say, the continued um, uh, development of his own career, um, you know, potentially going into politics like his dad, Amit Shah, who is the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi's right-hand man. Uh, but also because he has been seen as the right person to keep, I suppose, pushing the influence of uh, India in, you know, global cricket terms. Um, by, um, you know, things like pushing for an ever bigger share of World Cup revenue, um, doing things like, well, there's, you know, there's agitation at the moment for, say, the World Test Championship final to be played somewhere other than England, because obviously India made the mm. final of it the first two editions, uh, lost to New Zealand, lost to Australia. Uh, so, you know, potentially the World Test Championship final next year is is uh, perhaps played somewhere... Um, that uh, spins more than seems, as, a, as an example. So right. all of those things come into it. And, and what about the what about the actual home of where the ICC might be? I know in your reportage over the weekend, if if he if Jay Shah moved from the BCCI to the ICC, I know that Dubai has been the home of global cricket for a couple of decades plus now, maybe twenty five years. When you consider when they first put up the the ICC towers there, um, might it be that that could just simply move to Mumbai? Yeah, that's a scenario that's been painted for me by a number of um, uh, people closely connected to all of these goings on, that that is something that's been discussed fairly openly along the lines of, well, you know, India is the centre of world cricket. Why shouldn't um, the International Cricket Council be based there and, you know, essentially be based next to the BCCI offices in Mumbai? So a move like that, would have all sorts of ramifications. I mean, obviously, um, Dubai is a central location for a lot of countries. It's also, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that there were a lot of financial implications to that decision because obviously the ICC moved from London to Dubai in the early 2000s um, for basically for tax reasons. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think you'd see not only changes in what the ICC look like in financial terms, changes huge changes in terms of the staffing and um uh yeah you um you could you could see it uh, contract in size quite a bit in terms of uh, what it's been trying to do strategically for the last 20 odd years yeah it's amazing the timing here how it all sequences quite closely together with barclay finishing and the need for jay shah to move based on what the supreme court ruled Reminds yeah, let, me, let me let me add there just in terms yeah. of, of of greg barclay now um neither he nor um uh, nor Jay Shah have sort of declared their hand. 
Mm. Like Jay mm. Shah has not absolutely said, I'm going for this position, nor has Greg Barkley said, I'm going to finish or I want to do another two years. Everyone's kind of circling around it at the moment, um, trying to um, figure out what is going to happen next. But it does need a, uh, I suppose you'd say, an adult conversation to happen. Um, and that exchange has not taken place yet, which means that both the incumbent and the potential successor are, um, as I say, still circling around rather than um, uh, having a uh, having a duel. Yes, yeah, sure. But ultimately, we know who would have the numbers in that scenario in the event that it was a competitive election. And that Shah needs to move on where he currently is. I mean, he could conceivably um, do a term at the ICC, then go back to the BCC. I remember a scenario where that happened politically, where a leader went from president, president, prime minister, president. I mean, there are precedent. There is rather precedent for, for this kind of thing when, when there are um, guardrails in place. So that's all really fascinating. Uh, the other thing that's going on concurrent to that is there was the MCC uh, Cricket Connects conference that was held late last week at Lords, at the Long Room specifically, um, where quite a lot came out of it. Some of the heaviest hitters in cricket were there. Interestingly, Jay Shah wasn't able to attend. It was, have I got it right in saying that he was only going to be there if India didn't win the World Cup because they won it. He needed to be at the reception for the team uh, back at home and, and all the rest of it, which we saw those remarkable pictures on television from Mumbai. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think probably even more important than the parade in Mumbai, he had to be at the reception with the Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, with the right. Indian team, which uh, somewhat extraordinary. There's a there's like a 35 minute video you can you can find of Modi uh, talking with all of the Indian players. It's um you know if you if you if you would imagine the um, you know the the New Year's event at Kirribilli House with the Australian <laughs> Prime Minister, if that was um you know there was a 35 minute video of Anthony Albanese sitting down and talking in turn to each member of the Australian team. It's um yeah it's 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 a really you know extraordinary kind of piece of positioning I guess you'd say. Um, yeah. But yes, so he so Jay Shah was not at Cricket Connects. Um, having previously indicated that he would go, basically because there were more important things to do at home. Right. So what came out of Cricket Connects directly intersects, again, with what you're discussing in your reportage there. So let's use, for example, Test Cricket and the future of Test Cricket. And my instinct when this was announced by the MCC, I think it was earlier this year, was that it is the urgency piece, right? We, we know from the World Cricket Committee, the MCC run that and do a great job bringing very influential former players, administrators, relevant people together. And they, they turn that committee over quite regularly to make sure that it's people who are in more or less the public eye and in senior positions. And they've been on the front foot talking about the need for changes to be made to preserve the health of Test cricket, not just for the next three or four years, but the next 30 or 40 years. And it, my instinct was that this is what this was all about, trying to get all the people in the room to discuss all the issues around the game more widely, but ultimately to... Um, find where Test cricket sits, and on the on the other side of the ball here, it feels like a lot of the conversation has instead moved around to what the world might look like if the the Test playing nations reduced to even six was the number that you've got from someone that spoke to you. I know it's Chatham House rules, and we don't have the exact quotes to hand, but within four years, you had in your Sunday piece that we might only have six teams playing, which is a an unfortunate scenario that we've well we've all painted in our different coverage over the last couple of years since the. Um, Indian conglomerates from the IPL bought up uh, additional leagues in South Africa and the UAE, which complicated this yet further, the MLC as well. Yeah, and I think there's a, um, you know, credit to uh, Mark Nicholas, credit to the MCC, um, credit to, I, I think, both um, uh, sort of Jamie Cox, the outgoing head of cricket at the MCC, yep. um, and Rob Lynch, who, who's, who's coming in, um, you know, those are guys who've all got, you know, the um, the the preservation of cricket at, at heart, and I don't think many of the concepts, if any of the concepts discussed in the room, were particularly new. I think if you follow kind of the paper trail and what various people have been reporting the fa the past couple of years, you would find a lot of the threads that were um, discussed in the room, but. It was about getting those all together and getting people together to discuss them. I mean, one as one example, um, if you talk about the, I guess, the committee structure of the ICC, as a, you know, um, they've obviously got the cricket committee, which is a very, you know, um, eminent group of um, players, coaches, representatives from a, from across the um, uh, across the cricket ecosystem. Uh, 
and they meet and they make some very sensible decisions um, generally around playing conditions and you know things like how you how we're we using the DRS, what are we going to do mm. with you know two new balls in white ball cricket, all of that kind of thing. Um, but you very seldom get a situation where those people, the cricket people, are put together with the money people. So you know that was a really good kind of I think um, exercise in terms of World Cricket Connects to to get those sorts of people together to hear from each other. Now. In terms of the future of Test cricket, now you know the the, the key date here now really is twenty twenty seven because mm. there's only a you know a, a cohesive plan for uh, nine countries to be playing each other in a Test cricket league structure until twenty twenty seven. So there's two more two more cycles of it to go. Uh, after that point, um, yeah, it's really an open question as to whether there will still be nine countries that want to play in that league or can play in that league uh is that league going to reduce in size are there other countries that are only going to be able to play test matches very occasionally you know on a one-off basis um all of all of that is is part of the the discussion um and at the same time you know do england australia and india uh want to um uh be part of i guess more of an equalization measure conversation for 2027 in terms of sharing revenue so that countries that are not as big a market a team as one of those three uh, can you can have the money to invest in their first class system their junior development pathway keep uh, producing players of quality for test cricket um, who obviously also benefit the, the cricket system in terms of players who play t20 players who who play and win ODI World Cups, for instance, all of that together. So, um, yeah, that's that's the whole, you know, the the um, well, not the doomsday scenario, but the but the scenario where the size of the, the the Test cricket system could shrink to, you know, a level that we hadn't we haven't really seen since um, before World Series cricket. You know, it was mm. it was it, we have to go back to the nineteen seventies for a period where there were only five or six countries playing Test cricket. And we've heard that you know that quiet bit, quiet bit said out loud quite a bit at various times in the last couple of years. I remember an interview that Ravi Shastri did last year, for instance, where he was on the front foot saying there shouldn't be more than than half a dozen Test playing nations in the top flight, and, and if there is a second division, well, you know, so be it. But that'll be the World Test Championship, and you bang on about the the next FTP cycle ending in in well this FTP cycle rather ending in 2027 and there being no real clarity on, on what happens next. And, and again, this is not like a new idea. We've been all talking about this for a couple of years. Indeed, we've had on the program in the last 12 months, Richard Gould and, and Nick Hockley, for instance, the chairs, uh, sorry, rather the chief executives of the ECB and Cricket Australia, respectively. And they've both, and not just in those interviews, but other interviews as well, talked the talk about trying to find a way to develop a more redistributive model uh, to make sure that there is some support, some ballast there for, nation, for nations who are currently playing test cricket who don't make a buck out of it and trying to find a way to support them. In practice, I mean, we talk about test playing funds all the time, but do you think we're hitting a uh, hitting a, a friction point or a tension point where this simply needs to happen? And if indeed we are, do you think this will be the kind of week last week at Lords that prompts that into action or are we or are we too far gone now? And is there almost a concession that um, that, that, that time has passed? Look, I don't think it happens without, um, you know, the the the. I, I wouldn't say the attitudes of the ECB and Cricket Australia changing. I would say more urgency being shown by the ECB and Cricket Australia. The attitude change probably needs to come from the BCCI. You know, the the one of the interesting things about the recent kind of, I suppose you say, goodwill tour of Jay Shah. Um, he spent time in New York with Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL. Mm. Now, that was a really um, uh, intriguing scene in the sense that, you know, Roger Goodell and Jay Shah would probably see in each other an equivalency in terms of the IPL and the NFL. Uh, but it's really the NFL that international cricket needs to look at in terms of finding a more workable model um, where big market teams accept that small market teams bring something to the table other than the size of their market, which, you know, should have a value um, and a value that can be quantified in terms of money that will help both pay the players at the top, but develop the players underneath. Um, and so, you know, if, um, uh, yeah, 
if someone like Jay Shah is going to be able to spend time with Roger Goodell and you know hear about not only the I suppose you'd say that the fact that the NFL has grown through um, not expanding too quickly because the, you know the the NFL is one of the tightest kind of league competitions in the world in terms of uh, you know the jeopardy component and how many games each team plays, but the fact that for decades now they have been practicing you know in a very capitalist society in the US, um, yeah, a, a form of sporting uh, you know socialism and equalisation um, that has worked very well for the NFL worked very well for a lot of leagues. And, uh, yeah, really something that, um, yeah, is going to have to be considered if Test cricket is going to be continue to be played by, you know, nine teams or more. It's interesting that the, the conversation with our sport as it relates to the NFL is the, is the boss of the BCCI, one country, the biggest member financially, talking to, whereas, you know, um, well, this kind of goes to what, was reported by Gideon uh, out of the, the conference he attended at, at Lords, saying that Greg Barclay um, uh, was quoted as saying that the ICC is not fit for purpose as it currently is. And he cited a range of reasons for that, but it's not the ICC talking to the NFL, if you know what I mean. It's the BCCI doing it on their behalf. And look, there, there was more to this as well from inside the room out of Gideon's excellent piece that came out yesterday where Mark Nicholas at one point uh, asked Kumar Sangakara and Brendan McCullum how they would feel uh, if Test cricket wasn't being played in their two nations, i.e. if they weren't in that six still playing. And, yeah, the quotes that Gideon have here, are, I'd feel sad, I'd, I'd feel sad, but there's nothing much I can do about it, is what Sangakara um, said. And then and then uh, McCullum added what Sanga said. Um, so um, almost, again, a concession of defeat from two people who have so much authority in their countries. They've had these stellar Test careers. But, you know, as, um, again noting what Gideon says, almost shoulder shruggingly in uh, in Sangakara's case. That, that that feels pretty grim. I mean, I know that it must be hard for both of those men knowing that their countries are so far away from the decision-making brain of all of this, but still, they are full members of the ICC, and yet their fate isn't really controlled by their vote around the table. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think um, uh, something that was hoped to be achieved by getting all of these people together... It, I don't think it was just to have a discussion. I think it was also to, um, you know, enlist these people uh, in, I guess, a common purpose in terms of improving what the cricket system looks like. And so to have a couple of uh, cricketers who are as admired and loved as, as Kumar Sangakkara and Brendan McCullum, and in the case of Brendan McCullum, someone who, you know, is at the centre of an English test cricket you mm. know, program at the moment that, that, that speaks so passionately about saving test cricket or making it entertaining or making it you know better than it that it has been um yeah to to me that was uh that was very disappointing to to hear because um if you've agreed to be in that room you can't then say well it's out of my hands you've you've chosen to to get involved mm. Mm, you're there. That's right. You've got to sit at the table, and, and I guess not many people do. The the soft power piece to this as well, Dan, as we wind down our conversation, the very fact that India have gone to Zimbabwe to play a T20 series within a week of winning the T20 World Cup. It wasn't their first choice team. It wasn't the guys that won the World Cup, but another team to Zimbabwe. That's one thing that India have done tremendously well and have been really good tourists to countries that... Um, don't have as much commercial clout. I mean, you don't see Australia going to Zimbabwe and Bangladesh anywhere near as often as India do, as one example, or, or England too, the other members of the big three. And the fact that, you know, Zimbabwe won the first T20, great for Sikandar Raza's side, the, a, a former guest of the show, picked up a, a few wickets in defending 115. But, like, it doesn't really matter, does it, though, Dan? It's more about the soft power play here, right? As if Zimbabwe would ever be in a position where they wouldn't support what India want them to do, given that India are, are pretty generous visitors to their country. Country. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't think it's quite as simple as, you know, cricket tours for votes, but it certainly is a, um, you know, like as far as the BCCI is concerned, it's, um, you know, fiduciary duty to the other members of the ICC is to send teams on cricket tours, knowing that those tours will be commercially valuable. Mm. Uh, but we also know that a lot of those tours are now not as commercially valuable as they used to be. Uh, and we also, and in addition, you know, we, we know that, um, uh, you know, matches without a wider context. And as we know, like there's a league structure for test cricket, there's a league structure for ODI cricket, 
there's not a league structure for T20 cricket, even though there is now so much T20 international cricket being played bilaterally. Uh, and, you know, those matches are commercially valuable, but they are also don't have any context. And they're the sorts mm. of matches that players find themselves struggling to explain to each other, let alone the media or the, or the, or the supporters, why these matches are taking place. So, yeah, India um, continues to carry out um, you know that that duty to to, to tour and, and now because its cricket system has strengthened so much by basically because um, you know players are now picked from right across India rather than just from two or three you know big cricket centres um, to to make so much greater depth in Indian cricket uh, they can furnish you know, um, you know potentially they could have three different teams in three different formats all playing on the same day in different parts of the world and they'd all be high quality cricket teams so. Um, it is another facet through which India, um, uh, you know, expresses its, uh, its its soft power, if you will. And, um, yeah, it's something that, um, uh, you know, if we look at the Australian lens, India is coming here this summer, and that is not only a huge opportunity for a great test series to take place, but it's a huge opportunity for Cricket Australia to make all sorts of commercial ground into India, whether you're talking about, you know, corporates traveling over on, on tours, whether it's, um, you know, digital signage now that is getting so much more um, advanced in terms of the number of different, you know, territories you can have different things for. Um, all, of, all of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot that can be spun off um, an India tour, and that is part of how India, um, you know, exerts its influence at the ICC table. Well, it's been a big week in in, uh, in cricket off the field, uh, both at Lords and what's going on in boardrooms and all the rest of it. No one better than you, Dan Bredig, to bring us up to speed from the Age newspaper. Thanks for joining us and we'll check in again soon. No worries.